Good evening to you from Europe. Thank you all for joining. I'd also like to give a special welcome to the members of the Society of Robotic Navigation, whose committee kindly allowed us to use their mailing list. My name is Stephen Brown from Acutus Medical. I will be your host and moderator for this evening and our ongoing series of webinars, The History and Future of Electrophysiology. These events will be recorded and posted online. For the next six weeks, you can expect an invitation detailing the next episode. Their aim is to explore how the fundamentals of cardiac electrophysiology are being revisited and then applied in a cardiac mapping system with a radically different approach. This evening, we will commence with Dr. Andrew Grace, consultant electrophysiologist at the University of Cambridge Royal Patworth Hospital. He will present Seeking the Sources of Cardiac Excitability. This has been pre-recorded to allow Dr. Grace to respond to questions delivered via the chat medium. He will then be available for live discussion following the presentation. For those of you less familiar with the Zoom meeting format, you will find the chat button at the bottom of the screen near the center. If you have a question, activate this feature and type it in. Please post to everyone rather than just the Dr. Grace, as this will allow the entire faculty to enjoy them. If you would like to speak with Dr. Grace at the end of the recorded session, please indicate through the chat medium, at which point, as moderator, I will unmute the questioner. So, without further ado, please enjoy Dr. Grace's presentation and write any questions you might have for him. Hey, I'm going to be talking about the seeking the sources of cardiac excitability. This is a variation of a talk I gave in Oxford in June at the invitation of the leaders of that distinguished department there, the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. Um, this is the breakdown of the talk as I will present it. I'm going to first talk about the recording of the cardiac electrical field. The argument will be that basically the recordings of that and the uh, determination of the electrocardiogram that uh, provides the basis for the development of cardiology. It's based on electromagnetic field theory based on principles established in the 19th century and subsequently developed for practical use. I will then talk about seeking the sources of these cardiac electrical fields. This was of no real major practical importance until relatively recently, but in the mapping of complex cardiac arrhythmias exemplified by atrial fibrillation has become to the forefront of an area of interest in cardiac electrophysiology. I'll then talk about the response to the eradication of those sources being guided by the Acumap mapping system, which were the core of my um, presentation and the results that we have to date. Um, and I will then briefly mention how we can further exploit the um, observations of these maps of this complex arrhythmia to understand biological basis, mechanistic understanding that will allow us, in my view, to develop drugs and similar that can advance the treatment of, of the um, in our patients and similar. I will then conclude. So in terms of the recording of the cardiac electrical field, again, rooted in 19th century physics, um, there's a quote I just placed here on the left. This is from Richard Feynman. He won the um, Nobel Prize for his work on quantum electrodynamics, and he is well known in the 20th century as a teacher of physics, the great big three volume textbook based on um, lectures, he, lectures he'd given in Caltech in the early 1960s. But a commonly quoted um, paragraph from him in much of the physics literature is presented here. He states that from a long, long view of the history of mankind seen from say 10,000 years from now, there can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. And he was used as a comparator here, say the American Civil War, which obviously had massive geopolitical importance, but he's suggesting these mathematical elaboration of the laws of electrodynamics was more important. It's important though also to emphasize here that Maxwell's mathematical work was based upon wonderful experimental work that had been completed by people like Coulomb, of great interest to the work I'm going to tell you about, and Oersted and Faraday and others, who'd worked out the um, 
physical observations, if you like, on which he could then elaborate his mathematical uh, laws and rules. Um, the in, you might think, what's this physics got to do with us? Well, the point is that up till this time, there was much talk about vitalism. That is, it was felt that um, somehow um, organic organisms and humans would be included were somewhat different and had a life force within them, principles of vitalism, than um, would be um, required to explain inorganic systems based on physical chemical principles. The people who really made the link between physics and medicine were the, the Berlin School, the School of Organic Physics, um, exemplified by their founder, Emile Dubois Raymond, who starting in the early 19, 1840s um, developed measurement capability for recording bioelectric signals and initially concentrated on skeletal muscle and nervous conduction. Here we have an image from one of his papers, and he's actually, you can see there's a sort of mythical element to this in the sense he's ex um, represented as an experiment in Apollo, rather more muscular than he appears in other more formal photographs, but basically he's exercising his muscular of his arm, generating voluntary tetanic currents, as they call them at that time. He's got a galvanometer here on a different bench to reduce noise, but he could see electrical signals emerging from bodily movements that supported the idea that there was a linkage between measurements that had been made in physical systems and inorganic systems and something he could generate as an organic human being. And this set the stage for the measurement of electrical signals in humans, um, elect EEGs, for example, but more specifically, as far as we're concerned, the electrocardiogram. And he influenced an individual, Gabriel Lippmann, who was particularly interested in, in developing systems that could record smaller electric signals that might be generated by skeletal, mus mus skeletal muscle movement. And this is his capillary electrometer illustrated in the image on the left. Th this relied on the fact that the surface tension between sulfuric acid and mercury ten increases or is modified in the presence of small electrical signals. And this was then utilized by Waller, working in the west part of London, St. Mary's Hospital very specifically, who in 1887 had a paper in the Journal of Physiology where he recorded electrocardiograms from his dog, but also from humans. And they have the general appearance with the atrial signal here, the QRS called ABC in this terminology, and the repolarization um, exemplified or, or, or labeled here D, um, that would bear resemble, you know, you could recognize of having some similarities to electrocardiograms. Waller influenced then Eindhoven, and Eindhoven working in, in, in um, Belgium, um, of the Netherlands rather, he was responsible for using now the string galvanometer that was a more readily deployable system, as opposed to these capillary electrometers, more stable for recording ECGs. This piece of equipment was enormous though, you know, maybe a ton in weight, based in a different research environment to the clinical environment, and they had to transmit signals from the local hospital to record these ECGs. But he applied um, the standard um, terminology that you'll be familiar with. He got it from Descartes, P, QRS, T. But you can recognize this an electrocardiogram has you utilized in one of your clinics today to help you to guide the management of your patients. And the exploitation of this over the next 100 years, 120 years, has really set the stage for the development, in my view, of cardiology. There are two further names I'd like to raise to your attention. One is Thomas Lewis, but the other one is, is Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson working out of Michigan. And those three between them really developed the electrocardiogram going up to the 1950s that basically again set the stage. But cardiologists then had enough to do. If they exploited the, the electrocardiogram for the diagnosis of arrhythmias that came first, followed by the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, they had a massive impact on the health of the population to the population's benefit. They did not need that though to understand or seek down the sources. Seeking the source though became an issue as we now move through the 1960s and 1970s. And particularly in the 1970s, it was recognized that ventricular tachycardia might be approached surgically. And Bruno Tacardi, working in Turin, he um, developed the idea of a non-contact intracardiac electrocardiogram measurement system, if you like. It's not self-evident, I think, to our community that you can measure an ECG from within the heart chamber itself without touching the wall. 
Um, it just isn't immediately something that people would have thought about. But it obviously is the case. If you can record electrical signals on the chest wall, you can surely record them in the blood-filled chamber of the heart. This is his system, shown on the left. This is an open chest canine. Um, the electrode system is placed within the chamber. There are electrodes then placed from the epicardium through to the endocardium. And electrical pulses were applied through these electrodes and then recorded from the intercardiac probe. He recorded what he referred to as the earliest, earliest spatial negativity. The problem is that the um, cavity potentials are somewhat low amplitude and there's restricted resolution obtained through the system up to about 1.5 centimeters. This would not fulfill useful criteria for us and not be competitive, if you like, with contact measurements as currently applied at 1.5 centimeters. So getting that down has been, has been the agenda that we've been pursuing over these last small number of years. In regard to the, this sort of system, the non-contact mapping system to provide the inspiration for the development development by people like Graydon Beatty of non-contact mapping systems, uh, the Insight system, for example, but those had issues in terms of stability and such like. And so although they developed much in the way of scientific interest, they didn't, uh, weren't taken up rather as a, a broadly applied clinical tool. The first person who um, started to really draw our attention to the idea of moving away from empiric source determination and pulmonary vein isolation for the treatment of atrial fibrillation with Sanjeev Narayan. He used a voltage-based contact mapping system for source detection. And one of his images is shown on the left. The system for its recording is shown on the right, the radiograph where this multipole electrode array is placed in the left atrial chamber. Some practical issues here that in order to make the recordings, you require sequential acquisition and you have to interpolate. You can see these large gaps between the electrodes, and that means that a mathematical model is required to interpolate and fill in signals that are not, not otherwise recorded. Of course, it provides some element of global mapping, but does not provide the detail required to drill down um, onto source determinations. Also, because it's a, a voltage-based system, it picks up far-field noise and other artifacts. And it's physically basically non-ideal for the detection of compact sources. The system I'm going to talk about now is a non-contact mapping tool for macroscopic source detection developed by, by Acutus. And this, to my mind, is a revolutionary development in the sense it allows one to, to number one, record in a stable fashion non-contact electrical signals from the heart. It also allows you to drill down on the actual sources by using algorithms that take the voltage and then resolves the voltage down to the sources. And it's only, you cannot get to the sources directly. This is again based on a physical principle, a superimposition, this goes back to Helmholtz in 1853, whereby because there's a whole multitude of signals that scramble from distant recording, or even contact recording, you need to resolve it through mathematical means. And that's what this um, electro combined with the system that it comes with allows one, one to do. In terms of the recording electrode of itself, this is two and a half centimeters across. It's a very sophisticated piece of kit. There are 48 unipolar electrodes and 48 ultrasound transducers. It records 115,000 ultrasound points per minute, which I'll illustrate to you shortly, but very precisely, it records 150,000 intracardiac unipolar voltage samples every second. That allows a good deal of resolution, which I will demonstrate to you. Now, I just want to, um, demonstrate to you now how the maths is completed. This is not some fancy elaboration of the modern era. It's based on maths that's firmly based in the physics laboratories around the world and goes back well over 100 years, which I'll, I'll explain to you. Essentially, charge density provides the source of the cardiac electrical field, and you need to basically get back to that charge density. On the left now, it's illustrated the um, continuous charge layer that represents the electrical wavefront, largely based through the action of sodium channels as it moves through the myocardium. So you've got to think of the myocardial um, activation is moving along. And this charge layer then, then demonstrate, um, generates a voltage field. This voltage field is measured by a non-contact system. It would also be picked up by a contact system. So the contact system, all the contact system can do 
is actually pick up this voltage field and it cannot get down to this charged layer. The charged layer is much more compact than this voltage field. It's much tighter and sharper, which I'll show you again in a second. So if you can calculate this, then you're going to get down to the sources, which are with a much higher lev level of resolution than if you just relied upon the voltage layer. In order to resolve that charged layer, you need solid anatomy and you need solid distance measurements between the electrode, the recording electrode, and the, the shell, if you like, of the endocardial shell from where the electrical signals emanate. And a, a very cool part of this system is that it gets this spectacular anatomy. This illustrates the recording of the anatomy that's completed now over about a couple of minutes. You get this in your um, cat laboratory um, on the screen in real time. You move around and you fill in the bit, missing bits and basically you fill up you know, sufficient, if you like, for your purposes. This localizes surface, it provides practical advantage in terms of it, it diminishes the possibility of motion artifacts through respiration and similar, it provides a platform for your ablation, but most importantly from a scientific standpoint, it provides accurate distance measurements for the calculation of charge density. And those calculations are based on this formula. And this formula goes back to Poisson, 1811, French um, classic mathematical physics of that time that relates potential to charge. So what you do, you acquire the voltage at a number of points, 150,000 per second as previously referred to, and then you can resolve the local sources and exclude all the distance noise that you're not interested in. It tends to scramble the signals that you want to see. And this leads to these sharper electrogram calcip or charge density calculation based on the electrograms with a fourfold increment in terms of sensitivity and specificity illustrated by this burnt orange signal underneath the electrogram signal that you see superimposed on top of it. The process then is to record the electrograms at the acquisition rate as referred to. The system then solves for the charge density at fixed times and at multiple points throughout the myocardium. And then a movie is generated that you can then observe again in quasi real time on your screen and decide upon the actions you can take in terms of treating the patient that you have in the cat lab on that day. In terms of the observations made, there have been two perspective evaluations of this system published at this point. One is the dramatic SVT. Um, pay, um, study rather clinical trial that was incorporated in the JCI Insight paper published last year um, that I presented in Los Angeles American Heart Association meeting in 2016. We've seen it consistently over the period of time of using the system a series of patterns that can be broadly described as being focal localized rotation for obvious reasons and localized irregular activation that will no doubt be drawn out into further subsets over time as we gain more experience. But the breakdown in terms of percentages of these observations, obviously the data sets much larger now as time's gone by, is, is, um, is shown at the bottom there. This, these sorts of appearances map upon all this enormous body of work that's been done over over 100 years in terms of trying to work out the what's the best conceptual model of atrial fibrillation, whether it's a single focus that would correspond to our focal um, activation, whether it's circus movement, we see evidence of that also, or multiple re-entry. The point being that I think all the observations that have been made by these wonderful investigators going back many years and, and reviewed by Standard Tele Nature in 2002 can be incorporated in things that we are seeing. We move away, therefore, from the idea of a chaotic model of atrial fibrillation, some fundamental underlying organization that provides for tractability and a platform for treatment. So the question is, how does one then proceed? And what's the evidence that proceeding based upon these maps is going to provide benefit in terms of treatment of patients? It comes really from two fundamental sets of observations. One is in individual patients, and then there's aggregated data that's come from the use of what's been seen in clinical trials, as would also always occur in these sorts of situations. First of all, I'll just talk about a case of mine. Um, this was published in the European Heart Journal in 2017. This man participated in the dramatic SVT study. that was a trial designed simply to um, show that the system utility was safe and would provide some um, you know, illustrative um, data for the use in our patients. This 
man I know very, very well, born in 1960. It had recurrent persistent attacks of atrial fibrillation since the age of 40. He came to see me for a second opinion in 2004 because the people managing him were just going to leave him in persistent atrial fibrillation, which was not a state he wanted to remain in. He, he was felt very bad in that rhythm. He'd had multiple cardioversions um, up to that point. And then he's had quite a few since. Um, there's usually a gap of maybe 15, 18 months between the electrical cardioversions. I isolated his veins in 2009. And then went into check again in 2011 and did a series of touch-up um, lesions around the veins. In 2015, the episodes of atrial fibrillation having been spread out at maybe 12, 15 month intervals became more frequent to the extent we put him on amiodarone known that the Acumap system was going to become available. Um, despite being on amiodarone in October of 2015, he went into atrial fibrillation. We had to cardiovert him out that again. In the early part of 2016, we stopped the um, amiodarone and he proceeded to an ablation for atrial fibrillation in atrial fibrillation on the 21st of April 2016. Um, we first acquired the anatomy and this shows his anatomy um, reconstructed during atrial fibrillation. His, his CT scan had been completed prior to his earlier um, um, PVI procedure in 2008, so it doesn't directly compare in him, but in a multitude of patients, the anatomy that's um, been generated by the Acumap system completely maps onto the CTs that have been obtained in a large number of patients. In him, this is just showing recordings with a posterior view. Um, the, we saw, actually, uh, on the front view, there was an activation um, around the right superior pulmonary vein, but we, we decided this um, localized rotational activation inferior to the left lower pulmonary vein was of most interest. And therefore, in response to that, we provided a series of lesions across this and um, anchored it um, to the left lower pulmonary vein. And on the middle image here, you can see there's a line of block here. And this rotational activation has basically disappeared. This caused a, sh a shift in, if you like, of the activation sequence to the right sided veins, you don't see the full activation because I've only got the posterior view up there. But in response to that, we decided to do a, a large area whacker around the right sided veins. And at, with the final burn, at the end of that particular series of lesions, as illustrated now on the right here, he actually went into atrial flutter. And we therefore um, went, took the mapping basket, back across the transeptal to the right side. We generated a right-sided anatomy, which is pretty straightforward. And you see beautifully typical cavoidricuspid isthmus dependent atrial flutter here. Obviously, in response to this, we simply placed a line of block across the cavoidricuspid isthmus. He went into sinus rhythm, which is demonstrated here, showing sinus node activation and the line of block and basically has been in that state ever since. So this is a spectacular case of individual response um, of one of our patients to um, the Acumap guided ablation procedure. I do not believe that we'd been, we would have been able to efficiently deliver this treatment to this individual patient without having the Acumap available and to have such a sustained response to his ablation procedure again, I think is extremely gratifying. In terms of more systematic data, that's come from the perspective trial, which was published last in, in, in July of 2019 in Circulate Arrhythmia EP. Stefan Williams in the lead there. This is the Uncover AF trial, a prospective non-randomized assessment of Acumap in persistent atrial fibrillation. The majority of patients were recruited in the European Union, with some from Toronto. And the trial ran from November 2016 to April of 2017, 129 patients in total included. Um, they fulfill what you normally see in these sorts of trials around 60 years of age, 75% male. They'd have though proper AF, you know, three year history of persistent AF going back over time. Um, and the onset of persistent AF rather um, just going something like two years. So these people have proper um, full blown persistent atrial fibrillation and was significantly symptomatic in each case. In terms of the procedure, it was an adaptive therapy protocol. That is the investigators um, 
you know, first built up an ultrasound map, as I've already shown you in terms of the activation patterns. And here we now see both the anterior and the posterior views um, in an exemplar case. Um, the, so the atrial fibrillation was mapped and then they conducted their pulmonary vein isolation procedures. They would usually complete it in their lab. They're guided on this case using the Acumap system in terms of the anatomy and the lesion um, disposition, if you like. At the end of the pulmonary vein isolation procedure, it was complete in nearly all cases. There's remapping completed and identified in identifying areas of interest, if you like. Um, about four maps were completed per case, and then these were ablated um, and linked to fixed points and connecting to anatomic barriers or the PVI most usually. And that was completed in each of the cases. And then the patients were followed up. Um, and they were followed up very rigorously using patch ECG recorders over um, at least 24 hours, um, where failure was more than 30 seconds of um, documented cardiac arrhythmia. And on the basis of that sort of protocol, the results were very gratifying for first in man use of a perspective evaluation. And this is just a comparison, which I'll cover very briefly to STAR AF, where freedom from AF of greater than 30 seconds of AF after multiple procedure in, in our trial was 93%, comparing to say 79% in the STAR AF. So a very gratifying set of data on that particular um, analysis. Um, of scientific interest, I think, though, and also pointing the utility of the system, if more targets have been ablated in addition to PVI, then the odds ratio of success was substantially increases. Here it's ninefold increment, more than two patents types ablated, again, like a, almost a threefold increment in terms of success, pointing to um, a non-anatomically based strategy as being important over above the an on, a, on a platform, though, of anatomical based ablation. In addition, arrhythmia burden and quality of life was substantially improved by the application of this approach. For in a single procedure, approximately 90% of patients had a less than or equal than 10% arrhythmia burden remaining. And this just shows some data. But the point is the overall treatment satisfaction with the patients was massively uh, very positive. And certainly the feedback we had in our experience, I think we recruited about 14 patients this trial, was very positive. Um, this just shows a more granular analysis of the improvement in arrhythmia burden um, in patients in Uncover AF, a very um, promising response to the approach that was taken in that trial. So over and above this ex you know, immediacy, this demonstration in singular patients, which all people who've been using this, I think will point to the great positive experience they've had in individual patients, when we analyze the experience on mass, we get these also very promising observations, particularly for the early iterations of the system. The system has now been substantially improved in its generation two model, but also some of the people who are relatively inexperienced in the use of this study in the Uncover AF trial. Beyond that, what's the advantage of the system? Well, I think uh, we can now exploit as a biological investigation tool, frankly. And we're seeing a consistent series of patterns over and above um, the pulmonary veins. And it certainly raises the possibility in my mind, that this is a developmental disorder driven by um, genetic makeup in individual patients that is resolvable up to a point at this time, but can't be used to guide therapy. So on the basis of a phenotypic platform, I think we can determine um, you know, what's going on, make a link, if you like, between genes and function. In terms of you know, I've been talking about this for many years now, the idea of if we had accessible, comprehensive measurement capability, deep phenotyping, linking genes to function in our system, compared to, for example, in the world of neuroscience, allows us to really get a new taxonomy of disease. The whole point of precision medicine, if you like, very simple level, right versus left triggered atrial fibrillation. You know, there's no doubt that some patients um, have their atrial fibrillation not driven from the veins but driven from the right side and then again pulmonary vein versus non-pulmonary vein tr triggered atrial fibrillation these become you know really you know very much in our vision now that we can pull them apart and, and point to individual sorts of atrial fibrillation as opposed to it's just a thing um, that's exemplified by, by a particular pattern of an electrocardiogram 
We can also then drill down onto the genetics more with subset enrichment. That is, you'll find that some of the genes that are associated with atrial fibrillation will, for example, point towards right-sided versus left-sided atrial fibrillation, again, pulmonary vein versus non-pulmonary vein trigger. And I think we can use it as a platform for um, completing experiments in single cell biology. What, it is, what is it about cells that fire off repetitive signals to trigger atrial fibrillation from different locations, whether those are in the region of the pulmonary vein or further away and further disposed. And through drug rescue, we can set up drug rescue strategies for treatment of patients and development treatment platforms that go beyond ablation, because of course we won't be able to ever ablate patients and hybrid therapy with ablation and drugs will always carry a place um, but we've been very limited over a 30 year period with the range of drugs that we've truly got available. So in conclusion, seeking the source of cardiac excitability, the points I tried to make today is that the charge layer, a concept unfamiliar I'm sure with many of you, is the true source of the cardiac electrical field. And we can now exploit this to get to the sources, something that can drive cardiology and most specifically cardiac electrophysiology to the next level. The calculation of charge density now allows for non-contact mapping. Voltage measurements simply can't achieve this. And so therefore this provides the platform for the Acumap mapping technology that I, I think is going to transform what we can achieve in, the, in our field in cardiac electrophysiology. The maps we've obtained are plausible and they're actionable. Um, they're plausible, they fit into the whole broad raft of data that's been obtained over a hundred years. And I've shown evidence of actionability in individual patients and in clinical trials. And this remapping capability just can't be done through contact mapping. It's just not going to be possible with no matter what iterations of contact come along that you're going to be able to track down these signals as well as which they're just not based on the right physical platform that is charge density calculations they're based on voltage measurements that are far field they're away from the sources if you like and it provides a platform for deep phenotyping in an accessible quantifiable system that allows a links to be linked to be made between genes and function that provides a platform therefore for drug discovery and similar thank you Andrew, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to unmute you so um, you're able to speak now. Um, I noticed we had a couple of questions come in. Um, I don't know if you want to have a look at those and, and see if you wish to comment on those. So, so I can see them, so I can, I'll go through them in sequence. I mean, the first question asks, um, the final lesion set in the AF population. So the lesion sets were left to the individual investigators who participated in the trial. Um, they basically involved, um, first of all, deciding what, what they felt was important in terms of um, the rotational activations, for example, what were the dominant ones. And so the usual process, for example, for us, and I think for others, is that you basically map, you may have to see two or three areas of potential interest in the AF map, and you have to sort of think about whether you're going to deal with one or two of them at a particular time before remapping. If there's a dominant one, then you probably go for the dominant one. And in the, in the example I showed, the rotational activation, we cut across that, we went to anchor that to the left lower pulmonary vein, and that sort of process is exactly what went on in Uncover as far as we're concerned, and I think as others were concerned. If you felt that there were two um, processes going on in an individual patient that could both be contributing importantly, and you might want to take them out both at the same time before remapping. But remapping is so rapid and so efficient I think you learn far more by probably just taking one out and then mapping again. So in terms of uncover AF population, the lesion set was not set down um, specifically. Um, investigators were encouraged to ablate all relevant, potentially relevant um, um, circuits that they observed, but basically it wasn't mandated. And of course we couldn't predict the, how the individual cases would work out. And Stephen, I don't know if, if, is that sufficient for that one? I, can go. Uh, I think so, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so in terms of the next question um, is, is in terms of how, from our point of view, in terms of how, how are we going to expand it? I think with the availability now of Supermap, of course, there's an extension in the range. Um, initially, it was very much designed for 
atrial fibrillation as a complex, relatively unresolved cardiac arrhythmia. But I think now with Supermap, the capability of dealing with rapid regular tachycardias and dealing with the KRS complexes more efficiently, I think, you know, extends the range. And so um, we've got a problem at the moment, as many of you will have, and I guess that's why we're chatting this evening, but um, we're not doing our elective cases as we were. I think when this comes to this particular, the COVID thing comes to its end, we, st we will regroup as it were. And I think we're going to see a real expansion of this technology into a much broader range of our patients beyond the persistent AFs and the persistent AF redos that has been mainly part of our work at the moment. I think there's also plans from the organization to develop the technology to move into the ventricle. And again, that's of great interest to us. So I, I, I see an expansion of the technology across the broader range of patients and not just localized, if you were, in the, in the field of persistent AF, which obviously a very important part of our work, but to extend it beyond that is obviously going to be a, a, a good, a useful thing. Um, the next question, hopefully many of you will see, but I'll repeat, what kind of ablation catheters were used in the Uncover AF for sensitive ablation catheters? So one of the issues in, in that study, and actually obviously um, to some extent would have potentially negatively influenced on the results is the fact that force sensing was not available because that could not interface with the system in the iteration that we use. So what we, um, what I think is that you could argue that the results, you know, once the force sensing capability, and again, um, acutists are developing that to, to be compatible with their system, once that's available, I think the results that were seen in Uncover would be probably enhanced um, and moved to the, to the next level. So, I, I, you know, non-contact force sensing was not available. Um, a further question, I will continue, um, which has just disappeared off my screen. I don't know if Stephen's done that or... I can hang on here. Let me see if I can see that. Stephen, can I have the question back or it's all disappeared, I'm afraid. Not me. That's not really. Okay, so something's happened. So the next question is, um, what do we learn about temporal stability of rotors and focine experience stable for minutes, seconds or hours? I think the thing that's most striking is in the small number that we've um, done redos, as it were, we've gone back in again and you see stability. I mean, the, the areas, we, there's a, I think one of the limitations we have, the big limitation in the field is many of the signals of interest on the posterior wall. Certainly, I'm an extremely conservative um, person in, uh, myself, as I'm sure many of you are on the posterior wall. And I think um, that is a limitation. So we, we basically delivered energy on the posterior wall on numerous occasions and probably could have, would have preferred to have done more, but obviously don't want to do harm. And then when we've gone back in again, we've found those areas on the posterior wall are still active. So I think this points to temporal stability, in my mind at least, in a more um, robust way than any other data that's available, um, at least for me. And so I think there is temporal stability. I think, again, the point I didn't really make in my presentation there, I think it points to this idea, which is supported from genetic information also, that atrial fibrillation is almost like a, gen a developmental anomaly, if you like, that the pulmonary veins and, and their um, fixing, if you like, to the left atrial body is an area that's obviously um, is, is a linkage that's made um, during the development of the individual in utero. And I think there'll be areas, for example, on the posterior wall that similarly develop and they, they will be stable, they'll be specific for that patient and have been um, not acquired, um, they'll be exposed by acquired factors such as hypertension, diabetes, whatever, but they will be sensitive as the individual has, and clearly, therefore, they'll be stable over time. And that is, you'll see them at one point in time, and if you don't do enough, you'll have to come back and you'll see them again on a different point in time. And I get a feel that's what we're seeing at this, 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 this um, particular point. The next question refers to the sensitivity of the system to outside signals and noise. For example, stereotaxis, pacemaker, hardware, what, et cetera. Well, again, in terms of the physics of the system, it's designed very specifically to, ex to drill down on sources. And of course, sources, um, you know, if you, an ex the exclusion, if you like, of external noise. And the supermat gets around the, one of the major extraneous external um, signals that is QRS complex in a way that wasn't available on the 
iterations used with um, with the earlier um, trials, as I mentioned. I don't see any particular issue where the three um, air points of hardware here will be a particular issue and we've not seen those as issues. The next question refers to experience in ventricular tachycardia. The problem is that this particular basket design was really developed for the atrium and therefore it's not worked up, worked up as it was for the um, ventricle at this time. Again, I think the way that these business developments occur as well as the development in the field is you need to focus in what, on one set of questions. And the big question I think in the field was how on earth are we going to deal with persistent AF? And that was an, un, you know, an unresolved question. And so drilling down on that um, has been the agenda, but obviously moving to the ventricle um, and, and the application of this new um, physical approach to the mapping and the ablation of complex arrhythmias, I think is ideally suited to complex um, 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 patterns of ventricular arrhythmias, obviously with the super map, the application to stable ventricular tachycardias um, comes into the frame. Even the ablation of ventricular fibrillation obviously may come into the frame. I mean, it is something that I think is quite possible with this sort of system. The next question, how do you see defining PVI with acutus? Can it be done without a separate mapping catheter such as the suit? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the maps um, with the uncover, the lasso was not used for uncover. We did in the very early days use lasso just to demonstrate that we got, um, you know, that achieved um, ablation um, to get um, pulmonary vein isolation, but lasso is not needed to guide um, isolate, you know, to indicate you've got isolation. You, you can achieve, you can test that through using the catheter, um, your ablation catheter to, to, to look inside the vein on top of using the Acumap to, to guide the um, anatomy. And then the next question, do you use two acuter sheets if you want to map both right and left? What we've done, at least in our practice, I know Tim Betts in Oxford is, is, um, is mapping both right and left atria simultaneously. And you're obviously getting some phenomenal images from that work, looking at the relationships between activation in the left and the right side. In terms of the practicalities, if you've got a person in whom you think's got right atrial and left atrial rhythms, um, are, are, well, which we have had, then our general approach has been to go to the left first um, for example, they've obviously usually had atrial fibrillation. We've made sure the veins have been isolated, and then we've um, dealt with the left side. At left side, we have not cardioverted, and if they've remained in atrial arrhythmia, we've then come back to the right side. That is, drawn the um, the, the mapping catheter back into the sheath, pull the sheath back onto the right, map the map the right as I showed in the case report there and then um, or generate a new anatomy on the right and then map the right and then go on to ablate on the right. So we haven't used two acute sheets in our experience with Tim Betts, as I said, has been doing that and we're looking forward to seeing his data as it emerges. And then the next question, can you paste from the electrodes on the basket catheter? Well, you can't because it's a non-contact system. Um, you can push it up to the wall, but even then, um, I'm not sure, I've never, tried it but you can't paste from the system as it's currently configured at least I have not done that and I don't think you can do that the next question is is it time for a randomized trial I think it is time for a randomized trial at some point in the near future I think this at least this this time we've got to sit back and reflect on what we've learned to date will allow us to design such a trial and I'm certainly looking forward to being involved in the design of such a trial and its participation in that so um, I'm seeing a note from here from Stephen indicating we're reaching at the end and we have a time for one question, so I'll, I'll look at that. Are we able to assess ablation lesion efficacy using the ultrasound technology integrated into the basket? Do you foresee this as an area to be an area for development? As far as I understand, I have no um, up-to-date knowledge on this, but certainly speaking to the acute engineers even four or five years ago, the idea of using the ultrasound to look at lesion depth and similar is always one of their aspirations. I've not discussed it with them, with them just recently, but it seems to me that their ultrasound, with its again, its further developments and iterations, will allow us to tell, give some idea about um, lesion depth and lesion location. So I think that's again another exciting possibility with this technology. Thank you.
Andrew, thank you very much uh, for your contribution and thank you everybody for joining the meeting. Um, I will just say that um, this time next week we'll be coming to the end of our second session and uh, you may have heard some terms such as super map, which you may not recognize. Um, we will start to go into more detail in the following sessions to define exactly how this um, technology can be applied. Um, so please join us next week for Acumat 101, how biophysics created uh, Acumat. Thank you very much for everybody for joining. We very much appreciate it and hope you'll be able to join us next week. Thank you very much.